adjourned. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday was Orange Shirt Day, a day that honours residential school survivors, a day that reflects our attempts as a country to erase Indigenous peoples. And for what purpose? To have access to the resources of this land unhindered because our colonial government signed treaties they seemingly had no intention of following. Canada underestimated the strength and resilience of Indigenous peoples, and they continue to do so. Indigenous peoples have had to fight for their lives, for recognition, for rights. It is a matter of survival. Five of the poorest postal codes in Canada are in New Brunswick First Nation communities. Some Nova Scotia communities are not far behind. The livelihood fishery in the St. Mary's Bay is not a large fishing operation. It is a collection of individuals exercising their right to provide for their families and lift themselves from poverty. I read the article that Minister Jordan, the Minister of Fisheries shared today in The Guardian, honouring October 1st as Mi'kmaq Treaty Day. I respect the words that she shared, although they do seem to come a bit late considering how long this conflict has been going on. She stated that she grew up in a generation that was never taught about the history of Indigenous peoples. It was not until she became a Member of Parliament that she became to see the huge unsettling gaps in her education, including the legal and cultural significance of treaties and her obligation as a Canadian to uphold them. I commend her for being brave enough to admit that she came to learn about Indigenous history so late in her life. This is important, and I truly believe that a severe lack of understanding and education is at the root of the current dispute. In 1760, the Peace and Friendship Treaty was signed between the Mi'kmaq, Wulesok Gawiyuk, and Passamaquoddy, and the British Crown. It was recognized as an international treaty between two sovereign nations, and is upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada as being legitimate. On September 17, 1999, the Supreme Court of Canada acquitted Mi'kmaq Donald Marshall Jr. of three charges relating to federal fishing regulations. Marshall's legal team argued that he had the right to sell fish to make a living under the Peace and Friendship Treaties. Here is where the moderate livelihood comes into the picture. Marshall's ruling stated, the accused treaty rights are limited to securing necessities, which should be construed in the modern context as equivalent to a moderate livelihood and do not extend to the open-ended accumulation of wealth. Catch limits that could reasonably be expected to produce a moderate livelihood for individual Mi'kmaq families at present-day standards can be established by regulation and enforced without violating the treaty right. This begs the question, did the Supreme Court of Canada mean Indigenous peoples have the right to fish with no regulations, under DFO regulations, or under their own regulations? And what does a moderate livelihood look like in 1999 or 2020? I would argue that a treaty right is a designate of a sovereign nation, and to extend the right without the ability to self-govern is not appropriate. Indigenous communities and leaders must take the lead in determining the definition of a livelihood fishery with the support of the federal government rather than the intervention. To begin to set monetary limits on a livelihood fishery through definition is problematic. A policy drawn by the Mi'kmaq, Wulestogawig, and Besamakwadi describes a commitment to conservation as the first priority for the Indigenous fishery. The policy also specifies a commitment to education and peaceful coexistence with Canadians. It is as follows. Mi'kmaq, Wulestogaw peoples will exercise control of all fisheries resources within traditional tribal territories. Any fisheries policy must protect and promote fishing rights recognized within relevant treaties and laws. Mi'kmaq and Wulistikau leaders will not enter into fishing agreements that appear to abrogate or derogate from treaty or Aboriginal rights recognized in applicable treaties or are protected by law. Such treaties and laws express Mi'kmaq and Wulistikau responsibilities and intentions to assert full control over all fisheries resources within traditional tribal territories. In 2017, Fisheries and Oceans Canada began to negotiate time-limited rights recon reconciliation agreements on fisheries, signing two such agreements in 2019. While these agreements seem to be in good faith, there is no formal mechanism for negotiation for ind Indigenous peoples. The unfairness on display continues an uneven relationship and ignores self-governance and sovereignty on unceded lands. Indigenous chiefs have the capacity and the knowledge to advocate for their nations and negotiate with the government. I ask that the Minister immediately convenes a discussion table founded on respect and recognition that allows for these conversations to continue. I would also add that non-Indigenous fishermen must be given a voice. As frustrations boil over, the situation in St. Mary's Bay will only get worse. Thank you.
the Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, just thanks to my honourable colleague for the very thoughtful presentation that she just gave. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, let me be clear. No relationship is more important to Canada than our relationship with Indigenous peoples. Our government is working to build a nation-to-nation, -nation, government to government relationship based on respect, partnership, and recognition of rights. We are fully committed to working in collaboration with First Nations to implement their treaty right to fish in pursuit of a moderate livelihood. Since the landmark Supreme Court of Canada Marshall decision in 1999 that affirmed this treaty right, the path towards implementation has had successes and setbacks. Over the years, the department has launched several programs and made investments to address the rights of Mi'kmaq and Maliseet communities in Atlantic Canada and Quebec, beginning with the Marshall Response Initiative. Subsequent programs like the Atlantic Integrated Commercial Fisheries Initiative that continues to this day provide funding and support to Marshall communities to build the capacity of their communal uh, commercial fishing enterprises and to strengthen community economic self-sufficiency. Last year, we signed the Rights and Reconciliation Agreements with three uh, First Nations communities. But there are challenges. And recent events surrounding Nova Scotia's fisheries have brought these issues to the forefront. Mr. Speaker, I want to stress first and foremost that our government's priority remains the safety of everyone involved and to lower all tensions in the water through a calm resolution to this impasse. This has to be a common objective for all. It is also this government's commitment to work collaboratively and respectfully with First Nation communities to fully implement their treaty rights. The Minister of Fisheries and Oceans speaks directly and regularly with First Nations leadership and industry representatives. Mr. Speaker and honourable members and to that member, I think we can all agree that reconciliation is a Canadian imperative. And it's important, especially on this being Treaty Day in Nova Scotia, for each and every one of us to acknowledge that we all have a role to play. These issues surrounding this fishery are longstanding and deeply personal to all involved. The only way to resolve them is through a respectful and collaborative dialogue. We know that we need to do things differently and work in partnership with First Nations to launch a fishery where members of the community can earn a moderate livelihood. This fishery must be viable, sustainable, and have the tools it needs to succeed so that this fishery can be a resource for generations to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm saddened that this issue has led to blatant displays of racism, threats, and intimidation. Mocking traditional ceremony, social media posts about the need to re-establish residential schools, signs in the woods of New Brunswick saying, save a moose, shoot an Indian. I have heard from fishermen that there is a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, that the majority of people are not racist, and that they are just fed up over the perceived threat to the sustainability of the fishery. I understand the uncertainty of our economy, the fluctuation of our natural resources, and the stressful cycle of fishing seasons and unemployment. I understand the concern around conservation, but none of this can override the behaviours exhibited throughout this dispute. These are the questions and concerns that must be raised with government. As the lead federal agency for aquaculture development and consistent with its departmental mandate, DFO must act and discharge its responsibilities in a manner that adheres to the policy principles, including addressing issues of public concern in a fair and transparent manner, communicating with Canadians, and respecting constitutionally protected Aboriginal and treaty rights. Today is Mi'kmaq Treaty Day, Mr. Speaker. How fitting that we are here to discuss this topic of such historical relevance on a day meant to remind all of Canada that we are treaty people and that a treaty is a covenant of law signed among sovereign nations. In Digby, there were celebrations at the wharf, cultural displays and ceremony where the Mi'kmaq and Acadian flags flew together as they should. My work today is to ensure peace and prosperity for all as the treaties originally intended. Waliwin, Walalin, thank you. Honourable Parliament Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would again thank my colleague for her uh, very thoughtful speech. Uh, we as a government are fully committed to working in collaboration with First Nations to implement their treaty right to fish in pursuit of a moderate livelihood. The Marshall decision was the trigger for many departmental programs and initiatives that have been implemented over the years. These programs have provided fisheries-related training and increased employment in Mi uh, Mi'kmaq and Maliseet communities, especially for women. Uh, it has also put licenses, vessels, and gear in the hands of these communities to help build their fisheries. 
We have been negotiating with Marshall Group since 2017 to collaborate on the articulation of their right through the Rights and Reconciliation Agreements. But there, of course, has been challenges and recent events surrounding Nova Scotia's fisheries have brought these to the forefront. We remain strongly committed to working collaboratively and respectfully with First Nation communities to implement treaty rights. The issues surrounding this fishery are longstanding and deeply personal to everyone involved. The only way to resolve this impasse is through respectful and collaborative dialogue, much like we saw uh, from my member, uh, honorable member opposite today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.